So our next session is on ASL signing. Um, and it will be chaired and introduced by Professor Amy Sarkowski, who's a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, um, and a psychologist who specializes in working with children who are deaf or hard of hearing and their families. So, Professor Sarkowski, Amy, where are you? Yes. Oh, yes, great, thank you. You guys ready? We're gonna take a change in topic at this moment. We're still under the umbrella of communication, but now a different way of communicating with sign language. We have two fabulous presenters with us today. One of our presenters identifies as deaf, as a performer, and second, we have a sign language interpreter. Both these ladies are brilliant and we're thrilled to have them here and share their perspectives. And that perspective is gonna be about how sign language and that communication impacts interactions, specifically pertaining to beauty and gender. You guys ready? All right, let's go. Well, you guys can see, I am a female with a male voice right here. We have a male interpreter, so I hope you guys can kind of just reconcile that with the appearance versus the voice. But I think there would be a great actual match for this topic on gender. ASL, the acronym for American Sign Language. This language is complex, rich, it is full of history. This linguistic, beautiful language is something that I've had, and it's been part of American culture for over 200 years. It has been down since back in native times and has transitioned as a language like many languages do over a 200 year period. Now there are formal language systems, as we know, and how language develops is by the culture, the community, sharing knowledge, experiences, and therefore emerges further uses of language, language choices and signs. And those are based on culture that were predating those currently using it. American Sign Language has five distinct and unique parameters. I'm gonna show you these to help you understand how we communicate and how it has developed using a cultural framework. The first is hand shape. So obviously, for sign language, you need a hand shape like this or this. <laughs> so that is the shape of your hand is very crucial. Now, which hand shape you use really is dependent on context. Second parameter is location. Where is that hand going to? Then there are various categories within that. As an example, you can start up here, in this location, versus this location, versus this location, versus here, versus out here. All the signs that we'll be doing, and you'll see, have that specific objection, objective in using that location about what it's gonna indicate in the various categories and what it means. The next parameter is movement. So remember, we have the hand shape, we have a location, and now we're gonna put some movement to it. <laughs> now what does this mean? <laughs> Hello, <laughs> right? So there's where movement is the characteristic within the language, that parameter. Now what about this? What does that mean? Stop. That means stop, right? Or whoa, hold on. Or you can be welcoming someone. So again, movement is such a crucial aspect of language in its expression. So the next parameter is palm orientation. As I just demonstrated. As an example, using this hand shape, 
which would mean, hey, wait. Versus this, changing my palm orientation, could say you or only you or wait. It's the same movement, but the palm orientation now indicates a different meaning in the language. So again, palm orientation is crucial. And finally, but last but not least, is facial expressions. This is how you communicate feelings, thoughts. Also gives a sense of time. Also, as an example, using this, this is an example of indicating someone walking. <laughs> you get the picture. This is a long walk. Someone's gonna be dragging. So simply by that facial expression, we've been able to evoke if someone is having a good day or a bad day. So all those are parameters that are so crucial. And by the selection of those parameters can then craft your message and convey your culture, your personality, your tone. So now I'm gonna go back to the one of those parameters about location. These two are very unique, along with these other few locations, associated with gender. It's associated with male and female gender has already been assigned to those locations. Male is here. Any male-oriented sign is typically in this location. But why do you think up here? Any guesses? The brain. The head, intellect, what else? What else you got? Hats, okay. Yeah, so back in time where uh, gentlemen were wearing hats, uh, showing someone is a thinker as opposed to being emotive, logic, intellect, and of course, going on with those other adjectives. But again, that orientation, that location. Now, female, any guesses what location that would be? Let me see. Oh, interesting, I see a few. Nice, that's interesting. Why did you guys pick this as a location I saw in the audience? Emotion, love, nurturer, caregiver. It's actually this location right here. This is the location for female. So again, female-oriented signs that love, emotion, nurturing, typically have these two locations, but primarily on the chin here. So there's subsets within just the idea of location, which is, of course, indicating binary. You have boy as girl because of the bonnet, boys because of the baseball cap. So this is the sign for girl. So this is the kind of the language we use. So I'm going to give you guys, we're going to do a little hands-on activity. So we're going to pick a hand shape. Let's do this hand shape right here. So I want everyone to copy me here in the audience. We're gonna give you a movement. Now the term is gonna be mom. Where do you think that hand shape movement should go? Show me. Like this. Perfect. Now for the term dad, where do you think that hand shape would go as far as location is concerned? Here. Exactly. Great job. So similar hand shape, similar movement, different location. They are demonstrating the role of father versus mother, boy versus girl. Grandparents or grandpa, grandma. Would it be, what about grandpa? What do you think? Oh, wow. Yeah, right off the bat. And this would be grandmother or grandma. Notice that movement and that location. So that is a systematic way in American Sign Language using that movement and location. So now in a generation, fast, and for, fast forwarding to now, where we have the spectrum of male and female that we're looking at, how does this impact sign language and how it's expressed, where things are not already assigned? So as a deaf community, this is something we're starting to look at how is there, what is the sign to identify a gender? And other signs that we might not have signs for that have not yet been established.
So for example, the term transgender. And the sign is this. And notice that location. Why do you think this location was used? It's there to indicate the soul. The inner workings of someone's heart, their soul, all the rest is a shell. Everything else that's been biologically assigned, but to a person's soul. And so when they have that transformation, that's where that movement comes in that location. It's a beautiful sign. Now the hand shape like this, that hand shape along with that movement has a very unique theme and distinct theme. Now the sign for beautiful is this. Notice that hand shape and that movement? You could sign grow. Also a part of that same sign. Culture. So that hand shape in itself has a very rich history and such deep meaning and context. So to use that sign and assign it to who I am, how do I identify? And that's where the origin for transgender and that sign in our community. Another term, non-binary. We've heard that today. From a hearing non-signing perspective, you have the words male, female, binary, those systems have been in place. And those who are non-conforming, that's where we come up with the word non, to then show the contrast of that standard. Non-conformity, non-binary, to disassociate from that concept of the standard stereotype or that established systematic terminology. And again, in time, there will be new identities that will continue to come up but the first step and stage is to disassociate from the norm and those cultural words and labels as we know them. And that is also impacting American Sign Language. There are things that we might not have a sign and there are various rules, grammatical, linguistic rules that are associated to sign language. Remember, you have to have a location. Now think about this neutral space right here as a location. As you can see, it's disassociated from my body so as an example, you have non-binary, or just for short, the acronym NB, as in American Sign Language, will just use that short. But out in space, as you can see, is a different location. So this is something that's continuing to evolve. As we saw, hats and bonnets and various fashion items that we just talked about have changed till today. We also have that, the same thing with language, and it's a beautiful thing to see. We have one other activity before I'm out of my time here. I'm gonna give you another hand shape. Do this as your hand shape. This could represent an individual or a person. That's what it represents. Now, if someone was gonna indicate that that individual was working, excuse me, was walking, how would you do that movement? Like this. Or like this. Now, how would you demonstrate or manifest that person as masculine with that same hand shape and movement? What would you do? <laughs> you wouldn't do it by your head. Because <laughs> that actually would mean you're walking on the head. <laughs> Be careful of the location. Location, location is everything. So how would you express and demonstrate masculinity? How would you do it? Oh, you're kind of cheating doing two hands at once there. <laughs> okay, so you're adding those facial expressions, those non-manual markers. <laughs> you see how crucial it was to identify that person and how they identify. <laughs> now, what about a fem uh, female? In a feminine way, how would you do that? <laughs> same sign, same hand shape. Show me what you got. <laughs> See the difference? So again, back to those fundamental parameters. 
This is what I live and breathe in my work as a performer and an artist. How I can manipulate these parameters, those hand shapes, movement, location, orientation, and facial expressions to express who I am as a person. Again, expressing my worldview, my political view, my belief system, my culture, all in one. Thank you. Before we get on to my presentation, I just want to share a few disclaimers. For this, I will be using American Sign Language and English, but I want to recognize that that has an inherent privilege for the language I choose to use. For this presentation and this perspective, I will be using the terms female, which as an umbrella term, so I mean all of those who identify. So I want to recognize as a white woman how society views me how society views women and women of color and that discrepancy. So just as a whole, to keep that in mind. Also, I want to clarify some terminology that I might be using. I will state the word deaf, which is an umbrella term because it is a very diverse cultural community. And they all use American Sign Language, so that can indicate someone who is deaf, deaf blind, someone who's hard of hearing. But again, that language that they're using is American Sign Language but to interact with the world, they may need to use an interpreter for someone who does not sign. Also, I might speak about male and female, transgender as well, and cisgender. And I have two scenarios and anecdotes to show what it looks like as an American Sign Language interpreter, whether it's in public or behind closed doors. Here's the scenario. As a staff interpreter, I was working at Boston Children's Hospital. There was an appointment, which I went in, the provider and the doctor was there, speaking to the patient, this was post-op, and then was saying, hey, you gotta get off your butt. And the doctor, as he said that, he smacked me in my butt. Fact. <laughs> this recent Super Bowl, if you saw, there was a press conference where Mayor Walsh, and I was there on stage interpreting with him, and that was very public, and it was edited, where someone grabbed a clip and put it online on Reddit, and people then started making various comments about my look, my sexual performance, what I looked like. Just the commentary went on and on. It was a free-for-all. But those were two examples of me, just as I am, Jackie, but it's not alone. I'm not unique in that one experience. So it's interesting with this topic today and how we see women and how it impacts deaf men and how it impacts deaf youth who are boys. And that's what I want to share with you guys. So what was that like for you? Listening to me in a conventionally accepted male voice versus now listening to me in my own. How does that difference, difference shape your judgments about me? about your willingness to trust me, to hire me. I intentionally did not ask you if that difference had an impact. For today, I want us to examine that dynamic when deaf boys and men are working with female interpreters, American Sign Language interpreters, and I want to challenge you to examine your implicit biases and assess how, just as it says here on the screen, how and to what degree that experience of listening to a deaf man through a female's voice is impacting your actions. And what is your responsibility to make that connection more authentic? So why does this matter? In 2016, a researcher by the name of Punch in her review of literature found that deaf people were nearly two times as likely to be unemployed or underemployed when compared to non-deaf individuals. And yet, when it comes to one's career, a 2015 report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, put it bluntly. They said that your first 10 years in the labor market are likely to shape your entire lifetime earning potential. So it's not far-fetched to believe 
that because of society's treatment of women, combined with the fact that 86% of the people doing this work identify as female, is having an impact on deaf men and boys, and their social mobility, their lifetime earning potential. And so that is what the space I want to invite you into today to explore. A few studies to share to help illuminate further why this topic is worth our consideration. As I share these, I want you to think about listening to a deaf man through a female interpreter's voice. In 2012, Kapovitz, Mendelberg, and Shaker showed us that holding the floor for a greater percentage of a group's deliberation made you more likely to be seen as influential in the group. However, if you are a woman interrupting a man, you are likely to be seen as disrespectful whereas a man interrupting a woman was seen as more assertive. In a meta-analysis of previous studies, Williams and Tieden in 2015 found that women who assertively emphasized their skills, accomplishments, or desire to lead tended to be liked less and to be seen as less hireable compared to men describing themselves identically. Specific to the work of female ASL interpreters, Colleen Jones in her 2017 graduate thesis work found that non-deaf men who were listening to deaf men through a female's interpretation rated him as less intelligent and less trustworthy as compared to listening to deaf men through male interpreters' voices. And last, a 2018 study from ASL interpreter Lena Jenny looked into genderqueer and female presenting interpreters with masculine tenter, excuse me, female, female interpreters with masculine tethered traits. And she found that if you are masculine presenting and utilize masculine discourse traits, you may actually be compounding the discrimination faced by these deaf men. Okay, so let's see if we have this so far. If we're masculine presenting, we need to try to sound more feminine. But if we're feminine presenting, we need to try to sound more masculine. All women should probably try to sound more masculine when other men are listening, but don't interrupt men, right? <laughs> Got it. When it's all women, we can sound authoritative, but not tout our accomplishments. And when men are listening, or when we're in mixed company, we need to tone it down, but be ready to celebrate ourselves in a moment's notice. <laughs> Got it. So, because we are damned if we do and damned if we don't, as was just shown, many female interpreters report using any of the following compensatory strategies. We stand taller, we lower our voices during the interpretation. We dress in neutral attire that we think is more androgynous, although I just learned in the last presentation it's actually more masculine, which is really screwing with my mind. <laughs> Thank you. We maintain distant attitudes, we learn to interrupt to claim the floor, and we train ourselves to eliminate what is conventionally known as powerless language. <clears throat> Folks, we do all of this while navigating one of the most cognitively complex tasks out there. This is the world of ASL interpreting through the lens of a female ASL interpreter. I want to take a step back. So we just covered a little bit about what female interpreters are up against, but I want you to understand what you are, I want to know what your experience is. When you hire an ASL interpreter, what's that like? We'll take a broad stroke here, just so we can appreciate where the daily reality of deaf men and female ASL interpreters is situated. ASL interpreting as a profession was not known in the United States until 1964, which is when our national professional organization, the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, was established. We are predominantly female. As was mentioned, 86% of RID members who chose to identify a gender are female. We are overwhelmingly white. 87% of us doing this work identify as white. And this is why you'll see in my presentation today the majority of my photos are of, working, of white professionals because that's the reality that we're up against, that folks are dealing with, even though we are not representative of the increasingly diverse populations of whom we serve. At least 93% of our members are second or other, languages, uh, uh, other language learners of American Sign Language. Okay, so that's the larger context. We're a young profession, we are predominantly female, white women, and we have come into the language and the community as guests, or second and other language learners of ASL, present company included. Now that you have a sense of who we are, I want to look at some of the commonly reported experiences of this predominantly female workforce when working with men. Deaf and non-deaf men alike routinely apologize to us when they drop F-bombs. <laughs> now, when men are with other men, we know that they swear to uh, 
decrease social distance, for social power. So if they're censoring their speech because of our presence, how does that impact their interaction and its authenticity? Now this happens in one-on-one -on -one interactions. It also happens in larger all-male-only spaces. The entire dynamic will shift if I or any of my sister interpreters walk into a fraternity event or an all-male sex offender group therapy session or a, male, a man, a deaf man, wanting to find out what's up with his male doctor, right? So considering the reality that less than 14% of my field identifies as male, what other strategies can we and you who work with us, what can you do to level that playing field? All right, picture this. You're a college student, you're enrolled in one of the interpreting programs in the United States, and your college announces that a very well-known comedian is coming to campus. Interpreters will be provided, so naturally, you buy tickets, right? You want to see a real-life interpretation, you want to hone your understanding of ASL and dream about one day being hired as a professional sign language interpreter. <coughs> okay, so the show starts, and at some point, the comedian suddenly takes notice of the female ASL interpreter working. In fact, you might have seen these clips on YouTube. He tries to get a rise out of her. He starts using obscene language that I will not use today out of respect for my colleague working. But the interpreter maintains her composure, interpreting every single jab that comes at her expense. And you can't help but think, sitting there in the audience, is this what you're aspiring to be when you grow up? Exploited for a cheap laugh and used in public? Or anywhere? This situation is not unique to that individual I just shared. It's one that we found uh, have many of ourselves have found, excuse me, one that many of, our, of, of us have found ourselves in. <laughs> Consider the Reddit example that I mentioned earlier. It turns out, though, that it's not just the ignorant public who sexualize female interpreters. In 2008, a video relay service provider, one of the largest employers of interpreters nationwide, denied its female interpreters, its employees, the option of disconnecting from a serial predator who would connect with them on the webcam not to place a phone call but to masturbate in front of them. Again, it's not just sexual interest from deaf and non-deaf individuals. It's that female interpreters are packaged as a commodity and disregarded by even our own, by those who employ us and who supposedly have our backs. What I find myself wondering about, though, in these incidents and others, is the lack of accountability. These non-deaf people, intentionally or not, are disrespecting an entire population with their quips. There are deaf patrons wanting to see the show. Deaf people at home watching the press conference about the upcoming snowstorm, wanting to know what's going on, or a deaf man going to the doctor, wanting to know what's wrong with him, all of these without drawing undue attention to the fact that their communications with you are mediated through a female. For this next section, I'd like to borrow from the life course framework in the field of public health. And if this is uh, unfamiliar to you, the basic premise is that all factors, genetics, nutrition, uh, social relationships, financial security, and exposure to environmental toxins and the like, all of these have a cumulative impact on one's health throughout their lifetime. And so what we experience today as chronic physical and mental conditions have root causes that date way back. Now, if we take that life course framework and apply it to the life of a deaf male, for whom communication with non-deaf individuals, as we've discussed time and again, is mediated through AS a female ASL interpreter, I want to know what's the cumulative impact and can we even name it? Please note that the following list is not exhaustive, nor is it true for everyone. Interpreters are not employed in all situations or to the same degree. I'm simply using these as exemplars. Let's start with a deaf boy's childhood. Consider his education and his extracurriculars. Please also know that 87% of deaf children in the United States are not sent to schools with deaf peers, deaf role models, and others who are like them in a visually accessible educational environment. Instead, they're sent to schools with peers and adults who are not like them, and their entire educational experience is mediated through a likely white female interpreter. So these are the public schools that they're in. So think about it, your classroom activities, your group work with peers, maybe even your social connections with peers, all mediated through an adult woman as a young deaf boy. But it's not just about the boy's lived experience or others' experience of him. How does the presence of an adult woman impact him in ways that we might not even be able to name? That's what I want to know. Let's look at adolescence. Let's take some common experiences. Driver's ed, internship interviews or placements, meetings with guidance counselors to talk about your future plans, athletics, if that's your bag. How is an adolescent boy's experience shaped by working with an adult female for these rites of passage? What about how others treat him? What opportunities he's offered? What he learns about his changing body, about networking, or getting ahead in love, life, and his career? As a young adult, 
What are the social, financial, and academic impacts of having a female in your college classes or in your vocational training? Or in Greek life, right? All you want to do is make a solid impression as a pledge or shoot the shit with your fraternity brothers, and then here's this woman in the middle of it all who very well may be your parents' age. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying these poor deaf guys, right? They have to work with us. And I'm certainly not saying deaf men and ASL, female ASL interpreters shouldn't be working together. I'm just arguing that society's view of women has short-term and long-term impacts on these deaf boys and these men and their lifetime earning potential, their social mobility, and perhaps even their health. Lastly, for social services and healthcare, many of us can agree that we feel more comfortable when we're working with a healthcare provider who shares our same gender. Deaf men are not afforded this luxury, though. It is more likely, more than likely, rather, that at some point they will have a female present for their consultations, for other healthcare encounters that many of us can agree we'd rather not have someone of the opposite gender in. Okay, and so here we are. All I have for you is questions. Uh, and what I want from you is introspection and a willingness to own what's yours to own. If we buy that non-deaf people often see us interpreters as extensions of deaf people, then how you see me as a female may be helping or hindering someone else's social mobility, maybe without you even realizing it. Thank you. Okay, so my first comment is for Rosalie. First of all, you should know that Rosalie has the Rosalie Show. And you should also know that there are a whole <laughs> bunch of videos online of Rosalie doing signed interpretation of various songs. They're amazing, check them out. Um, oh, Rosalie. Thank you. thank you for that comment. Yes. <laughs> when you're in situations where there's mixed deaf and hearing groups, how do you claim your space? In what context, if I may? So space relating to, if you mind, give me an example. Yeah. If it's a mixed group, there are some individuals who are deaf, some who are hearing, some who are male, some who are female. How do you, when you really want to make a point, how do you make sure that you have um, the ground to communicate? Well, in my work as an artist, my space, my palette is the stage. So using the platform in itself, um, that is my space and where I can express myself up here on stage. So allowing myself to play along that spectrum. Again, it could be politically related, personally related, a narrative or an anecdote, uh, worldview. So using that space, I'm able to control the dialogue and the flow of communication and information. Okay. Jackie, question for you. Last month, I had the opportunity to present at a conference of superintendents of schools for the deaf. One of those individuals is male, and when he followed up to see who the interpreters would be, and the conference had hired two female interpreters. He demanded that a male interpreter be hired, and. Um, it, it became part of the political discourse. He made the argument that it was important for him that his voice be perceived in a way that he felt represented who he was. I just wonder if you could reflect on that. I think it's very much related to your talk. Um, if you were to give advice to others in that situation or something, well, how might, what might you respond to that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having that internal debate about which language to choose again, <laughs> uh, how to respond. I think I wholeheartedly su support that decision. And in fact, in my work, predominantly with women, other uh, female interpreters, and th on the rare occasion, which by the way, folks, the fact that there are two male interpreters as part of the interpreting team is really screwing up everything I just told you. <laughs> I have nothing but respect for my colleagues working. I appreciate them giving their time today, and damn it! <laughs> no. The truth is, though, that more than likely you're going to be working with female interpreters. Um, but on the rare occasion when I do have a male colleague and we're at a, an event where there's a deaf male, uh, there have been times in the past where we have intentionally uh, assigned the male interpreter to make sure that he is always interpreting into English when that deaf male says any deaf man says anything because 
based on experience, it's harder to claim the floor. It's harder to interrupt with my voice. People don't give that deaf man, regardless of his position in the company, which is interesting, they don't give him the space. So your question to Rosalie about taking up space, <laughs> a man's voice, honestly. Um, and so <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's very true. Uh, so, oh yeah, please. Yeah, if I could uh, piggyback on that. Um, Marlene Matlin, you guys know the well-known actress who's deaf, she always has a male interpreter with her. And the reason is to remind people that I am my own person, I'm my own individual. So sometimes you'll be looking at her and Marlene and interacting with her, but you have that male voice. And sometimes if she's working with a female interpreter, then that kind of blurs the line. And then they start focusing and interacting with the interpreter and thinking about the interpreting process and oh, look at that beautiful language, as opposed to actually interacting with her directly. So she's always made sure to have a male interpreter work alongside her. So again, based on context, whether it's a presentation formally in an academic setting or what have you. A, a friend who's deaf was telling me about other deaf professionals she, she knows who are men who will intentionally, when they travel, request female interpreters to screw with the audience and jar, jar the, the ear, <laughs> right? So you can manipulate it in that way and, and use us to whatever your goals are you to, to accomplish. Mm -hmm. From the spec perspective of both an individual who is deaf and an individual who does interpretation, I wonder what your thoughts are about ways that we need to infuse training to help interpreters to become more aware of this and to help deaf individuals to become more aware of how they might request interpretation. Okay, so see, that's my problem, right? Because. <laughs> If you look anywhere in the literature, if you look at how we train interpreters, especially female interpreters, it's how can you be more assertive and more dominant to take up the space so that you can placate the society and let it continue running status quo. My question to you all, as majority non-signing folks, is what is your responsibility in that, right? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna deflect that question, right? Back to you. <laughs> we are training female ASL interpreters to do all the things that I just said and more. And uh, I, I won't talk about what, what we should be uh, encouraging the deaf community to do, but my, my like, call to you all is be a part of that process too, right? If you're hiring an interpreter to interpret an interview for an employee coming in or whatever ways you're interacting with us, be a part of that process, find out who the interpreters are ahead of time, set up time to meet with them in advance, check in with the deaf folks, make sure that they are satisfied with the services, all of that. I think. Everybody has to be present in that process and stop pretending that we can just blend into any sort of situation and, and pick up right where you've left off, even though we're there for a day, we're there for an interview, we're there for just a snapshot in time. We need you to take the lead on that. <laughs> Please and thank you. <laughs> amen, I can just add an amen to that. Yeah. I'm curious, Rosalie, about um, the added demands that you see being placed on you in, in situations like those interviews or situations where you're interacting with individuals who are not familiar with deafness or deaf culture, um, where do you see the responsibility being yours to educate and where do you see the line between it really isn't your responsibility? For thoughts on that, I think it would um, really depend on the environment. When you're dealing in a personal uh, situation where it is a medical appointment, I think it's medical related, medical issues, I want to focus on that information as opposed to being an educator and role at that time. I'm a patient, so for the patient to then explain, oh, this is the role of the interpreter, this is the role of you as a doctor, no. You know, as opposed to in a different environment or context, as an example, like a IEP meeting, so in a K through 12, uh, such situation where there might be an opportunity there to explain about the communication roles and again the objective is to get the results that I want so I have to kind of walk that line um, again just what the overall objective is and in working and in, in, in interacting with me so sometimes it's an educational role sometimes an advocate role sometimes it's me to step back and just be me so it's like hey that's your job not mine great in line with Jackie's comment around what can we do to be active around that, I do want to applaud Radcliffe for inviting ASL interpreters and having interpretation at a lot of their events. Um, and to reiterate both to Radcliffe and, and any others who are planning events that when you 
have that available, it really does increase the likelihood both that deaf individuals can come. Um, sometimes people say, well, nobody's asked us for it, but they might not know that that's a possibility. So by arranging that and making communication accessible, I think that's a very important thing that we can do to be proactive. Um, and it also increases visibility and awareness and, and access in ways that are really important. Mm -hmm. With that, I'm going to turn, open it up for questions. As others have said, please join us in the center to ask a question, and um, our speakers will respond. Thank you so much for helping me understand the way that gender is based on location um, in so much of the signs. But I'm curious about the way that gender accidentally works its way into speech and sign in the way that kind of declarative statements tend to be read as more a kind of a male speech pattern and interrogative statements tend to be read as more of a female speech pattern. And I'm wondering, what are the accidental ticks inside a sign that could show unintentional ways that gender um, has a kind of woven its way into sign? It's gonna get another interpretation of that because that is a deep concept for sure. <laughs> Jackie? <laughs> so one example, and please, Rosalie, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So the sign is we talked about mother or father, mom or dad, but now in the LGBTQ community, and you have non-binary individuals, so it's like mom, mom. So it's kind of like, all right, how are we going to sign that? Dad, dad? Or in the middle of those, of those two uh, established locations? So just an example like that, that has that um, attributed to it. So parents is signed like this. So if you had two moms, then it's like, are you gonna not go up to the higher location for that sign that is indicating parent? So also in this region here around your nose, it's typically negative. Something that is lousy, smells, stinks, Actually, this is a sign for penis, since we were on that topic today earlier. <laughs> just the nose. I, 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 all right, well, just anyways, it's not really a positive place, so <laughs> it's just kind of maybe around this region or this location. So there has been some discourse as far as whether that is a positive or negative attribute of that location. But again, it's something that is very fluid and evolving, and over time we will get to the right sign, so definitely. And if I could add, just from an interpreter perspective. Um, I, I'm sorry? That's okay. Just a moment so for the interpreter. I have a, one uh, perspective from the interpreting world. So in um, ASL, pronominalization is gender neutral. And so when you're an interpreter working with a deaf individual who's referring to someone in space, but they haven't told you their gender, they haven't told you anything about them, you as the interpreter then have to make that decision. There are so many different strategies we use. Sometimes we get our foot caught in our mouths where we assign a gender to someone who we think, and then we end up having to backtrack and, backtrack and own that um, error as well. But specific to the language that, that shows up in our work as well. Uh, one interesting thing about American Sign Language is this right here, this indication using as pronoun is actually very neutral, which works for an interpreter, as Jackie just mentioned. It's like, and I could sign this and be like, it was he or she, or this person told me, or this person told me. So that's one example of that uh, neutral <laughs> language. And that's more work for you, Jackie, sorry. <laughs> Does that answer your question? I would say with facial expressions is probably the parameter I would refer to. Um, I gaze and glance like this, where your eyes are looking downward. The use of hands like this, 
that is indicating a status or class. Or as opposed to doing this, ask her or he. So again, that could then refer again to a status and class. So location that way is one way of indicating that. So there is a way of inferring it. So there's a lot of ists, oddest attitude, racist attitude, whatever the case may be within the diverse community as it is in society as diverse as it is to indicate that status just by that range of height and location. Also a sign, also being um, conveyed very you know, small signing space or a large signing space like this. So those are other ways within, again, how you morph along those parameters and so slight changes can indicate that power and control and status as an example. Does that, does that work for you? <laughs> All right, great. Next question, please. So interesting. Um, I had a question about the idea of seeing women in positions of uh, authority. And is there a corollary view? I understand the idea of um, the, inter the gendered interpretation upon males, for instance, having a female signer and that sexist interpretation that's coming from the hearing uh, community. But in, is there a corollary um, impact of boys growing up seeing women in authoritative positions that actually empowers a kind of more equal gender uh, dynamic within the deaf community? <laughs> That's a new research project for Jackie to take on. <laughs> that is a great, great question. So maybe I would then counter that and say, is the societal view of sexist perspective, is that paralleled in the deaf community? And I would say that it is the same. Um, so there is a ist, a sexist. Um, so if you have that, it doesn't really uh, matter if the person is deaf or hearing whether that is impacted in that dynamic because the person is female or identifies as female and is Caucasian, would that make them less sexist? I don't know, That's, that could be a great research topic though. <laughs> I can add just from a developmental psychology perspective that the idea for young boys, like elementary age, for example, the way that they connect with teachers and paraprofessionals, you know, lo they, looking up to them and feeling that connection with their teacher. But we definitely see from, in a clinical <laughs> view, adolescents, middle school, high schoolers, who then have to rely on that. They think it is a very different kind of a relationship. So in part, it might be, here's another nurturing person who's involved in your life, which can be great, and a resistance to feeling, to needing that later on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we need a uh, voice interpretation, please. <laughs> well, I'm just asking you to come up here. Yeah. So we can see. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm just going to kind of throw this out there. So an event where you have, as an example, Martin Luther King. There's an event with MLK Day. And then you have an individual who's assigned as an interpreter. How are they gonna handle that? Where they're white, female, as opposed to being someone who's a person of color. Now, how does that go as far as the perspective of assigning that person? Is there an option? And which one would you pick? And which one should I pick? Should it be the person who is of color just because they're of color? Just kind of throw that out there. And we might not have a response, but it might uh, come down to resource availability. So just a thought about that. I would say that in the industry of interpreting as a profession, it's been terrible, to be quite honest, with interpreters of color. And sometimes to say, hey, we want to grow that population and that demographic, but to really actually proactively go out to that community as a professional, um, as a profession, we haven't done that yet. And it's really, it's past and overdue. It's past time. We hope that's something that we'll uh, take on. Uh, there is a grant, um, a project, CLIMB, actually, 
and that is trying to increase the working population of interpreters of color to do legal work um, as part of their professional development. Um, you know, working in courts, you never think about like, okay, well, this might not be fair for how I'm representing and really thinking about, it's supposed to be justice. It's justice within the justice system if you think about it. So it's a double layer there as it is. So whether it's dealing in the justice system or whether it's dealing in the healthcare uh, environment, it's, it's time, it's overdue for sure. And thank you for bringing that up. Also, if I could uh, comment on that, as far as manipulating the results, if I could say, as a black hearing individual who's speaking to an audience of white or Caucasian individuals. They would prefer to have a white male interpreter because in that way there's a relatability and see that common ground, which then triggers an allyship, which then triggers active listening. So then you have a black audience or um, having that opportunity to have a, a person of color in the audience and then having that same demographic represented by the interpreter. So again, it does depend on the result and the objective and what you're looking for. Uh, so that would impact the judgment and the decision of whether you were getting a person of color or a Caucasian, a male or female identifying interpreter. I would add that people like Jackie are very conscientious of that. And uh, the choice might sometimes be, well, I'd prefer to have another person do it, but if it means there's going to be no interpreter present, I'll take the job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question. Yes. I want to thank all of you. This is so wonderful, all of you. Um, my question is about getting older and using ASL. And I'm so impressed with the, the physical vitality and the manual dexterity this beautiful language asks of you. And I'm trying to imagine my mother who has arthritis doing this. And so it started me thinking about what happens as you get older. Perhaps you lose a partner who is your, also your interpreter. Um, and also curious, do you lose words the same way that I'm starting to lose <laughs> words? You know, you're reaching for them. I'm curious about the process of aging with ASL. As I mentioned, those five fundamental parameters, you can't live without those. So you can't do it if you don't have the hand shape. You can't convey the language. But you have those four other parameters. Would you be able to use those to convey something? If you do have movement, you could recognize there is movement, but without the hand shape, it then indicates something different. So trying to uh, adjust, as an example, um, my grandfather is deaf. He signs very low like this in the signing space. <laughs> and I'm trying to understand, I'm like, raise your hands up. <laughs> and he's signing so low in that space. But over time, I've gotten used to him and his mannerisms, his use of space, location, and I know what he's indicating. Sometimes there's some guesswork involved, you know, and I'm trying to like, all right, I think that's what you're saying, which would be no different than you as you're interacting with someone else who's hearing in the spoken language. So I guess trying to convey that language, um, if you have a weakness in one of those parameters, the other parts of those other parameters can then reinforce that. Uh, I want to talk about the practical implications of that too, working as a hearing interpreter, non-deaf interpreter with aging populations. Because so many of us have come into this language as second language learners, we miss nuance. We are never going to be 100% native in what we do, right? And so fortunately, we have uh, tandem colleagues who are deaf themselves, uh, language professionals, um, uh, who we refer to as certified deaf interpreters, who are going to be these language specialists, grew up in this world, visually acquainted to the world, just like these aging, or these aging individuals you're mentioning, um, who for the arthritic hands, who are missing parameters or what have you, they are going to work with these individuals, much like Rosalie and her grandfather, in a way that I or any of my colleagues will never be able to do. And so we want to see more and more of these deaf professionals, uh, deaf interpreters, that, that field needs to expand ex exponentially um, to be able to serve the aging population, especially the baby boomers uh, in whatever, however many years. So. We are over time, so we will wrap up now. This is how you clap in ASL. So thank you to our panelists, and we'll be back over.